I think one of the things I'm really big on is not being a branded a consultant. I think yeah. the connotations around that means fat old white man with grey hair. You know, you look at some of the memes, some of the funny faces, um, and some of the you know most viral videos. They all have that kind of organic feel to them. What you want to pay for when it comes to influencer marketing is influence. You know, there's also case studies where some of these people can buy fake likes, and there's this kind of influencer fraud battle. Of course, I mean, LinkedIn's changed my life. Um, plain and simple, I would not be here today if I didn't kind of invest time in LinkedIn. What I will also say is, you know, Gary Vee's almost fucked the platform. You know, our first brand campaigns were uh, with like ASOS, Spotify, you know, we worked with Apple Music, Warner, Nike, Adidas, McDonald's, like there isn't a massive brand pretty much that we've not worked with. Right, so welcome back to Fly High Media Talks today. As you can see, we've got a pretty exciting guest for you. Um, we'll let him introduce himself. Um, but yeah, let, let's just roll from there. So Tim, go ahead. Uh, cool. Um, I'm Tim Hyde. I'm 24 now. Uh, I run a social media marketing agency called TWH Media, um, X Lad Bible and Social Chain. And yeah, I'm very fortunate to sort of work with some big clients all over the world, um, sort of specialising in acquisition strategy. Cool, awesome. So we'll jump into all the stuff like social media, like the Bible, stuff like that, because that's exciting stuff. But um, just for the listeners and for our benefit as well, what does TWH Media do? Especially? Yeah, so um, it's, it's a mixture of sort of um, paid media advertising, consultancy, you know, holistic marketing strategy. Um, and yeah, we work with a kind of a range of clients. So Apple Music, do a lot of influencer marketing and paid um, marketing for Revolu. Uh, and then there's a lot of like e-commerce acquisition strategy. Um, that we do in North America and sort of helping grow brands push past that five figure and trying to get into that sort of six, seven and eight figure um, kind of bracket. Interesting. How do you, what are the sort of some of the, I don't know if you can expose any of the stuff, what are the most sort of influential tactics and techniques you use sort of these days to blow that stuff up? Um, I suppose from a tactical standpoint, um, I really believe in, you know, having that kind of omnipresence and an omni-channel approach. You know, typically um, one is where my specialism is and the fact that, you know, social media marketing has a much lower barrier to entry than other types of media. Mm. But, uh, you know, I really do believe that, you know, even things like email marketing, which isn't the sexiest thing in the world and doesn't work on me as a kind of, you know, millennial or Gen Z technically. Um, but actually as a marketer, that's some of the best campaigns I've ever run. And it's about, you know, distributing that risk with that kind of cross channel, cross platform approach um, and understanding how, and why you're kind of investing in media and content to actually then, you know, build those touch points with the user, take them on a journey, and then, you know, cons take them into that consideration and purchase stage. That's interesting, that. We do, I mean, that ties in a little bit with sort of what we do in terms of social. Not to that yeah. extent, I don't think, because no. what we do is predominantly, we welcome to you, basically, we're going to work in consultancy, i.e. putting together the strategy, working with the client, and then implementing it in-house or we work on uh, basically taking over the account and then doing it ourselves. So what do you guys do in terms of, what's your predominant, do you prefer being more hands-on and actually being sort of, you know, in the dirt or more consultant based on working with their in-house teams, things like that? Because obviously big, big, big accounts like Apple, for example, or whatnot, they don't hand everything over, right? Yeah, um, I think it's a mixture. I think one of the things I'm really big on is not being a branded a consultant. I think yeah. the connotations around that means fat old white man with gray hair. Yes. And, <laughs> and you know, I think, um, giving someone advice it is you know something that can be really valuable but actually I think there's a massive difference between telling your friend to invest in Bitcoin five years ago and actually investing in Bitcoin yourself and I think so I you know really enjoy consultancy but actually you know I get a lot more out of it from a, on a personal standpoint when you actually help with the execution rather than going you know here's one strategy day in a deck you go away and do it because you know especially when it comes to social media strategy yeah, there are some nuances to it and some sort of, you know, stuff that you can't find on the internet. Um, but for the most part, you know, the real key is in the kind of high quality and consistent execution, not just, you know, you read this social media strategy once and, you know, you're going to grow to a million followers. It's not like that. You know, it needs to be that consistent, high quality content posting, right posting times, you know, right amplification strategy. All those things add up over time. It's not just, oh, we've got this really cool strategy. It's going to work. So you're telling me you can't put together a social media strategy in a day and be a millionaire tomorrow? Well, I mean, contrary to everyone's belief, um, unfortunately not. I mean, you know, some people have done it extremely well. I think as well, just with how, you know, the marketing industry, social media industry has gone, um, there are so many different case studies which have worked for people. So, you know, influencer marketing, obviously a huge, huge part of what we do and what a lot of businesses do. 
and, and people um, have amazing case studies. So um, actually Adam, who was on your previous podcast, yeah. his mentor and a, and a lady that we know quite well called Greta, um, she's launched, I think, four or five, seven and eight figure businesses, literally just launched in front of marketing. So not only have they built the brand, but they've actually driven significant amount of acquisition. Mm-hmm. Now, if you're a new emerging brand now, you see that case study and you go, well, of course we're going to invest in influencer marketing. Why wouldn't you? Mm-hmm. But again, just because of how the industry's changed very, very quickly, you have to have such a phenomenal product to you know, ask one influencer to post about your brand one or two times and to actually drive acquisition as well. And that's where I think there's a lot of gray area that people think that you know because they've seen a tactic work elsewhere it's definitely going to work for them and that's why we like to sort of distribute that risk you know it might not be facebook and instagram advertising in my experience you know it at least gives you a very good base level you know performance marketing on snapchat is something that works actually really really well at the moment you know influencer marketing can work really well and so you know for me it's again distributing that risk trying all these things out and then it's you know a, a matter of logic of going well, that channel's making us more money there. Let's invest there. You know, I think, um, especially social media marketers are very romantic about the specific channel. Like, you know, you or, or any marketers, you go SEO, SEO, SEO. It's all about SEO. That's all you're going to invest in. Or it's influence marketing, influence marketing. That's it. Or it's just paid social, paid social. You know, mm-hmm. right? Some of those case studies can be, you know, unbelievable. But again, you you don't want to just have one silver bullet and not be able to, you know, distribute that risk. Yeah, sure. So. Um, I mean, it's all about finding the right solution just for the, you know, the, the client, isn't it? First and foremost, and then that's obviously the skill of the marketer, isn't it? Or marketer? How, how do you pronounce it? Marketer. Um, I, I'm marketer. both, to be honest. <laughs> both, yeah, yeah. So it's it, that's all about the, um, you know, the the, the agency. Um, so, in your opinion, like, how what would you say the 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 downfalls of influencer marketing are? Like, what what would you say? Like, if there's been any failures to past campaigns or anything like that, what were the reasons? Yeah, I think that. loads. Um, you know, typically brands, you know, over over invest and and need yeah. that um acquisition very very quickly, which is not depending on the product is just not how that purchase journey is going to work. Yeah. Um, and actually, you know, from a strategic standpoint, I really think that people um invest in influencers wrong, because actually, I think if you choose the right influencers, um, you can get great you know distribution channels, the great media, and pretty cost effective. You can get amazing content creation, which we all understand is now actually you know pretty expensive and especially if you're quite a small business um, and then again you know actually does drive purchase decision so from an investment standpoint that's brilliant but actually i think you're much better kind of using that as an awareness play and using influencers as a kind of upper funnel awareness and engagement and from consideration stage not for lower funnel purchase decision yeah. and actually if you know you build those relationships organically authentically as you know the buzzwords you hear all the time and then look to sort of drive them down the funnel and actually ask them to buy later, that's how you can get some really great influencer case studies. Not this, you know, basic, you know, 20% off this watch, you're going to buy it now. It, it, you know, the industry just doesn't work like that now. So obviously you, you work with influencers a lot and influencer campaigns, and we know obviously from the stigma attached to a lot of the stuff on, on social media, especially Instagram, there's a fine line between an actual influencer that has an influence on a brand uh, from the you know, top of the funnel level uh, and somebody that just got an affiliate code for Daniel Wellington or whatever stuck a picture of it on Instagram and now all of a sudden he's an influencer how does that work in your in your world where you work with influencers and then there's people people like that as well yeah I think you know from an affiliate standpoint that that's something that's brilliant for any brand you know any different type of business we would all love to have a model that if you pay 10% for an acquisition you know that's unbelievable from an agency side from an e-commerce side and, and actually just selling a product you know having guaranteed and only paying out once that acquisition is made is a perfect model but the problem is you know eventually that you know acquisition and kind of strategy from an affiliate standpoint will kind of run out and again you know that again for the most part is um, Mm. leveraging the people in the kind of lower funnel stage Mm. and it's very difficult to kind of hit someone with a product or, or service and get them to purchase straight away. And so affiliates tend to be you know, very good at that you know, consideration stage. When it comes to influencers though, I think they're a lot more malleable and I think you can, depending on how you use them, you can get a lot more value out of them if you understand where you attribute that. So for example, um, Daniel Wellington, you know, they had an am- amazing awareness stage and have great content and you know, stuff that they can then utilize from their performance channels as well. And if you value that at whatever you're paying the influencer, that can actually be recouped in a return and investment standpoint, rather than going, right, we've paid them a thousand dollars, 
you know, to support our business, we need to get three thousand dollars worth of sales. In this day and age, that's just not going to happen. Mm. And so you, have, or I don't, you know, I think influencer marketing still can be very valuable, but it can't just be that kind of in and out. We're going to pay someone a thousand dollars and and just make more money. I don't, I think that is very specific case studies where that will happen. Yeah, is no. influencer marketing becoming more expensive or? cheaper I think it's definitely got more expensive, more expensive. Um, I think it's also more competitive anything um, will with the demand actually yeah I think you know there, there's a lot more demand for it um, mm-hmm. I think the fact that people are also very aware of mm-hmm. the value of their channel yeah. um, and some of those values are because specifically in North America they just have much bigger marketing budgets and so there's a huge skew of what their actual value is and what they fit that what the perceived value is you know it's an unbelievable you know Kim Kardashian now charges a million dollars per post on her Instagram. However, you can flip that and you go, do you know what? She probably do- is that influential with a specific target market that she actually might, and, and you know, in some cases, it definitely has you know, generated more than a million dollars worth of sales. So that, from an investment standpoint, it is brilliant. But again, you know, it's a big pay to play and there's a big barrier to entry to yeah. have a million dollars and hope that her audience are online at that time, then it is going to drive that, that kind of acquisition. Um, and so from an industry standpoint, I definitely think it's getting more expensive just because the, the influencers and micro-influencers and anyone with any sort of audience are much more aware that they can monetize it. Mm-hmm. Whereas, you know, four or five years ago when we started doing it, it was reaching out to people and they were going, oh yeah, of course I'll do that for 20 quid. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you'd get a brilliant kind of deal out of it. Whereas now, you know, they understand they can make a lot of money for it. They understand it's valuable and that definitely drives the price up. There's two things I want to touch on that actually to extend from it. One of them is something that you witnessed the other day in that, which was you were at the Champions League final. I was indeed, so apologies for my voice. It's not quite yes. recovered. <laughs> ale, ale, ale. <laughs> Take that. Edit, edit that <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's an he's Everton fan. He's an <laughs> um, but you saw what happened. It was uh, the Russian supermodel running onto the pitch promoting yep. for free. We did a video on it actually yesterday. Yep. I um, don't know when this is coming out, but her, she went from like 600,000 followers to a couple of million. Yeah, two mil. Like yeah. that. And then yeah. got her account banned, and now it's back. Yeah, so, so <laughs> give us a little insight about that. So what, how does that impact her going from 600,000 to two million? Uh, how does her account being banned? Do people want to work with her just because she streaked pretty much half naked? Do some brands want to like work with her or not? How does that work in your world? Um, in my world, I think, you know, I think you have to look, depending on your brand, depending on your service, you have to... Um, really analyze what that ambassador is bringing to the table. Mm. So someone like Disney is never obviously no. going to use <laughs> some, someone like her. However, she actually has incredible media value, and, and you know, right now she has a lot of attention on it, which you know some brands can actually leverage. I think she was actually advertising her boyfriend Vitali, who streaked the 2014. Yeah, World she was Cup advertising final. his. Banned from every arena. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah it was his uh, adult prank channel. Yes. Yeah. Prank, prank, prank channel, not porn channel. No, it's um, prank, but stuff that would get taken off of YouTube and Vimeo. Everything yes. gets taken off YouTube nowadays, but like... <laughs> yeah, and, and so I think one of my favourite things is how Americans sort of um, exaggerate things. It was like, that got $4.6 million worth of free media value. I mean, she didn't make $4.6 million. No. Like that. And I think, you know, I understand how they've reversed engineered to get to that point. However, if you look at the growth of her channel and how she would be able to charge for media on that, you know, I think that has, you know, at least tripled in what she can now charge, which is great. Um, you know, the key for her now is to continue to generate momentum to, you know, double down on what her niche is and what her brand is and stay consistent and actually build that positive sentiment between her and her audience because that's what the influences is and that's what the value is. Um, you know, one of the examples we use all the time is the fact that, you know, you look at Lad Bible, Student Problems, Unilad, they're phenomenal media channels and actually you can get brilliant cost effective media on those channels. However, just because of how they've been built, and this is no fault of the channels themselves, but the audience doesn't care about that brand. Mm. They, they, you know, it, it's just a place, it's a destination where they can see things that they want to see. Um, and so if Lab Bible wanted to sell their own t-shirts, yeah, they would make some sales and they'd make more sales than that influencer the other day that only sold 36 units out of her 2 million followers. But again, you know, they haven't got that strong enough brand sentiment to be able to monetize that audience in the same way that again, you know, um, you know, a Burberry does or something like that. Mm, mm, mm. No, I like they took it took it down that route because um yeah, what you mentioned about the they estimated that she she made sort of like four million or whatever, yeah. We I actually touched on that in the video that I made. So it was yeah, they estimated it was like three million dollars if they'd gone through official channels. And you're right, 
no one gave her three million dollars but the fact of the matter is whatever she made from that she made it for free the investment was zero well apart from a night in jail and she could never go to any football games again Um, but yeah we sort of compared that to essentially it's a growth hacking method because you're trying to get a mass scale at the least amount of cost and we compared it to a few 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 times people have done it in the past and big brands have done it in the past but. so i think that comes down to something that i find really interesting so at social chain and um, when i was there i was sort of head of campaigns uh, we did the top nine branded live streams of all time the most of which got sort of um 2.4 million comments in two hours um and it was very cool to have a world record and that viral marketing is brilliant for generating cost effective attention mm. and that's you know i think what a lot of social media marketing agents actually do really well uh, and unfortunately, it's something that still catches the attention of brands more than anything else. They go, oh, what's that shiny thing? You know, how do we get 10 million views on something? How do we get a viral bit of content? And, you know, for me, I think there's a framework to it, but it's not something you can guarantee. I don't think any agency can walk into a room and go, we can guarantee that that's going to go viral. You can put it into a position where it's likely to, you know, generate a lot of traction, but you can't guarantee virality. You know, you look at some of the memes, some of the funny faces, um, and some of the you know most viral videos, they all have that kind of organic feel to them. And as soon as you find out a brand is behind them, it kind of loses a bit of that. Um, and so you know for them, it the most watch get you know one point two billion people watch the Champions League final or something like that globally. That she is was always going to get some level of traction from it. However, from a brand, if that again had cost them a lot, it's not worth the investment. But again, as you said didn't cost them anything she's grown a brand phenomenally you know it's a great return on investment or return on their time without yeah. a doubt mm. yeah the website crashed with 24 hours <laughs> I think when you go about pitching like influencer campaigns and things like that how do you pitch to a brand I know you can pitch like you know impressions and things like that and you know potentially link clicks and things like that how would you you know pitch a you know rough return on investment I know you'd probably look at you know past case studies and things like that but you know, if it's a di- you go into a different industry or something like that, how would you go about pitching how much you can go, like how much you can return? Because I'm sure, you know, a lot of um, marketing managers and things like that and owners, you know, they're, they're just purely conversion orientated. So yeah, how would you- them for $3 million, they want to know what they're going to get in return. Yeah. Like. Which I actually think is fair enough. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I think we've, we're have we all in a very, very fluffy industry. You've got mm. social media there, you've got marketing there. And you know there there is a lot of people that chat shit to be honest, and so uh, there's an, it's no wonder that you know market managers CMO is very skeptical. Um, you know when we pitch stuff, um, a lot of it is holistic strategy, and so it is you know looking at how you can leverage all those channels at once. It's not just right we're going to throw 100k an influence campaign because do I think that would work? Yes, but for that 100k budget, if you invested in other channels at the same time, I think you would actually get better impact. So. I suppose, you know, if it was just an influencer strategy, it's past case studies, it's the fact that we have great relationships with a lot of these creators and influencers and have seen what they've actually driven from an acquisition standpoint Mm -hmm. previously, not just, hey, they're going to generate you 10 million impressions because, you know, it's just not worth that media value um, if you don't kind of look at what they're actually looking to acquire. Um, And then, you know, what I get really excited by is the fact that if you do invest in an influencer strategy and you get great content, not only does that help you from a you know brand equity, social media management standpoint, but then that facilitates you with some amazing assets for performance marketing that you could then put again, you know, forty grand behind one asset and you get an unbelievable return on investment in that. And you know, that completely dwarfs how however much you paid just for that kind of one social post or, you know, um, sequence of social posts on an influencer channel. So it's still all fairly trackable. As much as you can, you know, I think um, that's something that I really enjoy. I think, you know, the tangible results nature of social media marketing is great. Um, when I was at an agency, TK, I looked after like TV and radio and, you know, although those metrics are becoming more trackable, it's still so fluffy and it's, you know, having to kind of work out your analytics and kind of squint and going, did that really happen? And, <laughs> and you know, it, it ends up being a massive sales pitch to kind of retain that business whereas I like be, like being able to go this is what we did this is why we did it these were the results let's do it again you know black and white not this kind of wolf of wall street sell me your pen sales pitch it's all just like you yeah, know this is what we're going to do this is why we're going to do it if you're interested let's go you know I'm not going to sit here and you know give you a big sales pitch to, to go ahead that's the way to do it and that's definitely the way to do it um, last thing I want to touch on influencer marketing is we've seen and had the rise of influencer marketing and we're now seeing a lot more of micro influencer yep. marketing um, because I think people started brands started to realize that even though Kim Kardashian has 20 million followers that means her engagement rates 
obviously lower than somebody with 20,000 followers that has a 50% engagement rate because there are more of a tiny community. What's your view on that and where is it appropriate to use people like are much, much higher profile but get lower engagement rates and charge a million for a post? And when is it actually okay for a big brand to go to someone that has 30,000 followers and potentially sell to 15,000 of those? I think, you know, a lot of influence marketing is definitely targeted at Instagram. And so um, I definitely think that likes and engagement on a post is an indicator. But I think we've actually gone, you know, 2014 when we kind of started, it was on, it was, you know, everyone focused on reach. In 2015, everyone was focused on engagement. And now, you know, everyone's still kind of very much focused on engagement. But I think we've gone past that. You know, an engagement is a good indicator for how a post is done. But I know from, you know, everyone in this room, if you see something funny, it doesn't necessarily mean you'll like it. You might screenshot it, you'll send it to a group chat, you'll just forward it on to a friend. And so that content has made that consumer feel a certain way. And you know, you've got all the positive effects out of that, but you haven't been rewarded with that kind of positive engagement. And I think that's something that people need to bear in mind. What you want to pay for when it comes to influencer marketing is influence. And you know, are they are they building positive sentiment between that, you know, that person and their audience and does that fit your brand and that brand essence that's what I think you should pay for rather than going right are, you know, are we using it as a mass reach tool to just get X amount of engagements because it will lead to sales down the line when it comes to micro influencers again I think um, you know there's some phenomenal case studies but again you know there's also case studies where some of these people can buy fake likes and there's this kind of influencer fraud battle um, and you know I think there's case by case you can look at some channels and go that's brilliant value and this is what I would pay for that and then some some micro influencers you know they don't have any positive sentiment with their audience they don't have a really engaged audience although it is smaller um, and they're not worth the value mm. that makes sense yeah sure I wanted to ask you a few questions about LinkedIn because I know you're well, big on LinkedIn well. you know you've you've you know, you've built a big profile on LinkedIn, you know, you're telling me about some of the reach you're getting and stuff like that. Um, I know we just didn't say it, it, it's not, reach isn't the most important, but anyway, you've, um, you've obviously built a profile on there and it's, it's a solid profile. You get a lot of, you know, engagements each month. Um, so yeah, just talk us a little bit more about the state of LinkedIn at the moment and, you know, say, you know, how it's going. I know you said it's, it's on the rise and, um, we were talking about in, uh, LinkedIn, LinkedIn ads the other day, um, off, off the podcast. So, you be able to talk to us a little bit more about LinkedIn? Of course. I mean, LinkedIn's changed my life. Um, plain and simple, I would not be here today if I didn't kind of invest time in LinkedIn. When I was at Social Chain, I had a post that went super, super viral. Got like 3 million views. I was on TV in Australia. Um, and it was insane. And I just saw, you know, very early on the power that the platform could have if you weren't using it just how everyone else was, which is, you know, recruiter here, recruiter there, you know, showing off something. Um, mm-hmm. And so by taking a lot of the kind of psychology and strategy from other social platforms, trying to present yourself in the right way, trying to add meaningful value to your audience, you know, being good to people, responding to comments, doing that over a period of time has generated me, I think, something like 11 million views on my profile. And some amazing, you know, got to work with Liverpool Football Club, got to work with Western Union, um, got flown to Singapore, got flown to New York, all because of posts on LinkedIn that someone went, yep, we've seen you we've seen you over a period of time we like what you're about could you do this for us and so from a new business tool for me it's been absolutely phenomenal um what i will also say is you know gary v's almost fucked the platform um it's diluting it i guess because i guess everyone will start doing what he says yeah um um, you know gary's amazing and i'm i'm pretty close friends with a lot of his you know personal brand team and spent some time with them when i was living in new york Gary's amazing. Like, don't don't get me wrong, but his kind of army of people um, regurgitate a lot of the things that he says, um, and I think that gets very old very quickly. Um, and you know, it's fine hearing um, hustle harder and you know all his points of view from him, and then just hearing kind of a less than softened down regurgitated version from another thousand marketers in America can frustrate the the LinkedIn kind of community. Um, is what I'd say and. Um, how they're now tweaking the platform because there are more people posting you know there's less of an advantage that people that were doing it two years ago um but it's not all bad you know i think again you know who am i to tell other people to not use linkedin it's again changed my life um i suppose from an advertising standpoint um linkedin ads i think are very hit and miss so from a media standpoint the cpms are actually very very high um industry average for social media is about five to six pounds if you do Facebook well, you can get that from one to three pounds, but typically through an advertiser, it's not necessarily what you focus on. 
Mm-hmm. Um, you know, LinkedIn kind of starts at about 25 to 50 pounds, which is, you know, you're getting into that kind of radio CPMs. Um, and so it just means you need to have a really high conversion rate on the other end because to reach those thousand people, it's costing you a lot more money. Mm-hmm. Um, I've seen some amazing, amazing in-mail campaigns that if you've got, you know, big enough budget that can work really, really well from a prospecting standpoint and from a, um, you know, actual cold sales standpoint as well. Um, but, you know, you do need a bit of budget to test and the advertising platform is nowhere near as developed as Google and Facebook and, and things like that just mm-hmm. because you know, it's still a relatively new product. You could you could argue that, you know, when people are seeing adverts on LinkedIn, so say, for example, you're running a, a lead generation campaign for, you know, an ebook or a guide on, on Facebook, you, know, you could argue that that is, you know, a higher intent on, on LinkedIn because you're, you're there for business. 100%. Whether it's on, on Facebook, Instagram, you're disrupting someone's social pattern. So um, they're, they're in that, that frame of mind on LinkedIn. Couldn't agree more. You know, people are in that business frame of mind, which is why people charge a premium. And, and you know, I think the biggest thing that, that LinkedIn's trying to sell is the fact that you're targeting decision makers, which is, again, it, it's half the battle. You're not targeting everyone at the company. You're targeting it's quite hit people. and miss on Facebook, isn't it? Anyone, it, put, anyone could put CEO on. Exactly. Yeah. Um, it, it is very hit and miss. But again, you know, I think I'm just a big believer that if you do marketing or creative or anything very well on a channel, it, it, it'll still work. You know, TV has a massive barrier to entry. It's very expensive. You need great creative for it to work. But if you do TV well, it's got an unbelievably high upside. You know, I would never advise anyone to invest in print, but I can guarantee you if you do print well, it will work for your brand. And that, for me, it seems to be the framework of, if you're gonna do something, do it well. Um, I was a, I was consulting for Huel yesterday, um, and actually a couple of years ago I did some work with Vita Coco. Um, and one of the really cool things um, that they did was, all their marketing budget was just gifting and getting people to try the product, you know. Coke people weren't particularly educated about coconut water or these kind of crazy flavors. Someone did literally have to put it in your hand before you would try it. It's not something you would just buy. But what they did, which I found really interesting, was instead of you know hiring this kind of like on the ground agency, which is what you know Coca Cola do, you know you get given a can of a mango diet coke and you know someone's got a pretty somber look on their face and it's they're just getting <laughs> through the cans. Whereas they actually employed the guys at Visa Coco. So they would give it you with a smile on the face, they'd have a bit of banter with you, they'd make you laugh. And that you know, positive experience around the brand has massively fed into what they're actually about. And that, you know, I really love those like little tweaks that brands do to not only are they doing an activation, but they're doing it in their way. And I think that's how you can get great value. Yeah. So how do you, um, because if I'm honest, I don't really spot ads on LinkedIn uh, because they blend in very well on Facebook it's all about like Matt said disrupting the scroll yep and that's how you get the attention by disrupting the scroll by something either funny or emotional or whatnot. how do you get that same level of disruption on LinkedIn when you Facebook's got a very different level of there's, there's a limit to what you can put on LinkedIn okay. um, so how, how do you get that same level of disru- disruption with something that's a bit more down to earth and a bit more serious whereas on Facebook you can put you can go from a picture that's like some emotional thing about D-Day, for example, because it's D-Day today, and the next thing you scroll past is like a really funny video of a cat that's an ad. On LinkedIn, you don't really get that emotion switch. You don't get that pattern interrupt. How do you how do you get that effective? How do you get that effect on LinkedIn? Um, I suppose from an advertising standpoint, it, it's you know driving impact in that those first few seconds. Um, what I would say is, if it was my money and my brand, I would invest in personal channels and actually um, look at activating major stakeholders within a business. So it's personal channels because they'll generate much more reach uh, and engagement and, and to be honest leads rather than actually paying the platform to advertise. And so that's what we actually do for a lot of CEOs all over the world and you know people have just raised money is, right, okay, we are building a personal profile and a personal brand on that platform and are generating far better results for you know a fraction of the cost because you know you actually have mass reach on that platform whereas everything else you have to pay for. And again, you know, I don't think anyone can pull out a LinkedIn ad that they've seen that they thought was good, you know, whether it's in the right hand, whether it's, you know, almost like an AdWords ad at the top of the screen, mm. you know. They, Usually they, click on by accident, to be honest. <laughs> exactly. You know, sometimes there's some sort of nicely designed carousels, but again, they're adverts at the end of the day and you're not interacting with them. Whereas an interesting, you know, for example, posting this on your personal channels on LinkedIn, this is still, that could be an advert for prospects for you. And they get you know insight into the business. They get a feel for who you are and some of the topics you're talking about. And that's where I'd invest my capital rather than 
pay amongst in for, for leads basically so yeah like mm. the, whatever content we put out coming from the, the brand page it just doesn't do anything near the, the, the personal page because you know, it's like a personal connection doesn't it you can put a face and to it's the how page. the platform is you know it, it's exactly the same as how Facebook pages as soon as it becomes a business page your reach is restricted because they want you to pay for that space um, I actually do think 2019 the prevalence of those pers- like the brand pages on LinkedIn will become more valuable so you know I wouldn't tell you to stop that it's just going to be a long slog to actually build it whereas you will get a lot quicker traction on all your personal channels so like when uh, say for example on Instagram when you know a, a person so for example my, my Instagram account that's um, linked to like a business page does that make the reach go down would you say um, as opposed to a personal the research always suggests that it does Instagram yeah. have always denied that that's the case um, so you know you just look at the data I think now it's probably pretty similar but okay. definitely a couple of years ago when they you know brought out that business profile kind of option it definitely did restrict reach and people flipped kind of between them right so your on LinkedIn your first thing showing is land bible yep how was that experience what were you sort of in charge of tell us more about it because obviously it's a big brand that everyone knows so everyone wants an insight into it. how did you first and foremost like get into it did yeah. you apply or do that? yeah so um straight from school always wanted to be a journalist specifically a sports journalist and so instead of going to uni i did my nccjs so you like national journalism exams right and at that place they like it was like an internship thing so they paid for the course and i worked for them for free um as part of that um there's actually a pretty famous now graffiti artist called axi who'd done some amazing work and i like covered a few stories and he'd done some work in the lab bible offices and at the time i had no idea like i knew who they were but i don't think any of us have thought they even had an office um and ended up interviewing the ceos um and about two months later after i did that they offered me a, a job as a writer um i was staff number 11 and then we our focus as like a you know lab bible team on a lab bible table was to significantly you know find content grow the social channels grow the you know clicks to the website um which we did pretty significantly I think when I joined, we were on 1.8 million likes, and I left 10 months later, um, and we generated sort of 10 million likes, and the daily traffic went from sort of like one mil a day to five mil a day. So, massive, massive um, growth period for the company, and it was a yeah hell of a lot of fun. How many years ago was that? Uh, 2014, so four or five, yeah. Right. So how what I don't know if you still keep an eye on it, but from what you knew when you were there, and from obviously what Lad Bible is now, how has it shaped and pivoted and changed? Um, I can imagine there's a lot more process in place. Um, you know, then it was um, really leaning on people in the team's understanding of the audience and what would work well. And to be honest, a lot of it was test and learn. And so we'd put something on Twitter first and like see how it performed. And because Facebook and the algorithm was so, so important to the business, sort of it drove 98% of the traffic. We had to really nurture that um, that Facebook page basically. and. Um, you would look at it so we would always use content to sort of um, reward the algorithm and then you would sort of tease an article um, as a way of driving traffic and we were sort of some of the first people to kind of initiate that that, that strategy interesting so what happened how come you're what happened? how come you moved on to other things um, yeah won the company's employee of the year which was you know still something I've got on a wall which was very cool how was employee of the year Bible? I was yeah which um, month oh yeah no, it was a year. So it was for the year. Oh well. Then. So yeah, I, I won it and co-won it with. I think Mike's still there, head of content, um, extremely hardworking and a great guy actually. Um, but no, I got fired out of the blue, um, which was a bit of a shock. Um, and and yeah, it took me a long time to get over. But um, you know, is is what it is, I suppose. Um, don't still don't necessarily think it was right. But again, I wouldn't be here today if it hadn't happened and would have never gone on to work at Social Chain and you know, took all my kind of social media and like audience knowledge from there and applied it as a, a kind of marketer and yeah, things have gone all right for me since. So you mentioned it, social chain, because that's a, I want to jump in there, because that's a big sort of buzz around, buzzword around this uh, marketing space, especially in the UK. How did you get into social chain? Were you there from sort of the early days? Um, and what did it sort of look like? Because there now they've grown sort of rapidly, probably the biggest, fastest growing social media marketing agency in the world, I would assume, something like that. Yeah. So um, how's, how, how did that look? So I pl- I just you know sent an email um, and actually Ash who's now my one of my best mates um, responded. You weren't one of the ones that like threw a pigeon in or something as an application. I, right? I was a bit earlier than that. So, <laughs> uh, before uh, that man that started happening. I was staff number eleven. Um, is that the same as that Bible? 
Yeah. So that's, that's the, that. You're like a number. Yeah. So that's the only reason why I remember. I don't walk into businesses going, "What number of staff I have?" Someone gets fine and know his password. I know. Um, <laughs> um, and yeah, no, no. Literally met. They asked me to come in for an interview. Met Dom for the first time. Got on with him well. You know, um, had social media experience. Um, was also a writer at the time, and there was a potential play at the time to sort of um, double down on some of it from a media perspective and, and go more into publishing, but. Hopefully, yeah, you know, we, I came across well enough and they decided to hire me and we were actually in a co-working space in one room as part of the building. Mm. Um, so that would have been, yeah, end of 2014 and now they're in the entire building and have, you know, 180 staff in that building and I think, yeah, there was seven or eight of us then um, just in the office, which was very, very cool. So you said you started off as a journalist. How did you transition from the sort of journalist piece into social media marketing and influence stuff like that. Is it just your interests pivoted or is it a bit of both? You always interest in social media? A bit of both. I think, you know, I, I'm, I'm very competitive and I like being good at stuff. And I think one of my strengths as a journalist, I, will, I would always say I was a very average writer, but I was actually quite good at identifying the right angle, identifying the right story, finding things that were interesting. Um, and then when you look at that from a content standpoint and a you know, what things are actually talking about on social, I kind of felt like I had my finger on the pulse and um, it just, op- you know, it opened up and, you know, I worked very hard, um, yeah, worked very, very hard, learned a lot, taught other people a lot, had specific bits of insight because, you know, especially back then, there wasn't these, you know, 10 social media tips. We were kind of doing stuff, testing it, learning, doing it again, tweaking something and kind of continuing to, to do that. It wasn't like there was a, you know, book on social media of how to do it. So I think I, I really enjoyed that that freedom of, you know, having that trust from the business and, you know, my my managers um, and was able to, you know, grow grow with the business and became a director pretty early on. And um, yeah, we did some really cool stuff. That's fantastic, yeah. Did, would you say you were sort of at the forefront of that? that one company is also sort of pioneering um yeah so, i would I think, social media and disruption know, whether i would i would say that about myself but i think you know we did we pioneered the top nine branded live streams of all time which we've already touched on you know we worked you know our first brand campaigns were uh, with like asos spotify you know we worked with apple music warner nike adidas mcdonald like there isn't a massive brand pretty much that we've not worked with which is a testament to the team there um, and kind of give you some perspective on you know how big brands run things, some of the processes, the headaches. Also, at the same time, how you can then roll that out to smaller brands, and um, we we just learnt by doing, and um, fortunately, kind of had enough success where there was a foundation to work from, and, and kind of went from there. That's the sort of difference, isn't it? Being that main organisation that's sort of pioneering everything versus a hundred of thousands of others that are trying basically to copy everything you're doing but in reality that was going to be 10 18 months behind right yeah definitely um you know i think there's there's things that social chain pulled from other businesses steve surrounded by some amazing mentors you know um shat khan who's one of the early investors in spotify came into the office to to do talks and i think one of the biggest things from a culture standpoint at social chain was there was very much this like constant learning this like constant improvement mentality that specifically when it was early on, everyone had, you know, we all read Start With Why, we were all watching TED Talks, we were all, you know, in WhatsApps at late at night, speaking about different social media trends and, or even from a sales perspective, how you could improve that. And I think that as a mentality helped, not only the people within the business grow, but the actual business grow as well. That's how you want it to be really, to be honest. So it sounds like you're working on some amazing campaigns and met some amazing people and obviously you've learned a lot. How come you decided to take the route of, and this might help some people that are potentially in some agencies working in marketing and want to go out sort of by themselves. Why did you make that decision? What influence did you make the decision of leaving that sort of what's arguably the biggest social media marketing agency in the UK into going out and um, you said you didn't want brands as a consultant, but someone that works with other brands by yourself, starting yeah. your agency, what what made you, what helped you make that decision and why? Um, for me, never thought of myself as an entrepreneur. Uh, I probably do now, um, given I've got quite a few different ventures, but um, it was just the best decision for me at the time. You know, it was still massively scary, but you know, I left Social Chain, went to TK, was there for six months, did some cool stuff. But basically, I had three clients that were offering to pay me more money than I'd ever earned in my life. Um, they were retained contracts. There were people I already knew, um, and it was that simple of, right? Okay, this is this will make me more happy. This will make me more money. This is actually going to be focusing on what I'm good at. 
I took the leap. And and so, you know, it wasn't this kind of, I didn't wake up one morning and go, I want to, you know, have my own business. I, I really don't care. And I think it's why I don't push TDH Media as an agency too much because I don't really care. I care about the work I do and the case studies I have and the people I work with far more than, you know, having to build a big agency. It's about, you know, being proud of the work that you actually do. So what's the goal for TWH? Because you said you didn't want to leave. We had a bit of a chat about this off, off camera beforehand. So there's a difference between, sort of, for example, how we run stuff. We want to leave it as sort of like a legacy thing, um, teams and stuff like that. Whereas you're more of a, I'm going to do what I want, um, do what I love. It's not in a bad way, but obviously people are different. So what's your goal for TWH Media or for, for your own brand? Or how do you want to leave things, for example? How, what do you want it to be in 20 years? Do you still want to be doing the same, same thing? I'd be very lucky if I can. Um, you know, for me, I, I get to do some really cool stuff. Um, cool. It's surreal that I still get to work with big brands and have enough case studies and social currency behind me that they'll, you know, willing to take my advice on stuff. That's still, I think, very cool. Um, I suppose from a goal standpoint, um, I'd I'd kind of need to level level up. Um, from a financial standpoint, from an impact standpoint, keep getting these case studies that I'm proud of, um, and and just doing more of it. You know, I think agency life can be very up and down and and you know even just staying in the game can be half the battle because you know you'll have a couple of down months and then you'll have a month that you never thought you'd ever have and then it'll go down again and, and it's all about that you know managing the kind of roller coaster um and for me i you know measure my happiness based on quality of life you know even these little things like being able to get an uber home and not being worried about the cost mm. you know that a qual- that's a quality of life thing that i very much enjoy getting to travel the world getting to work with clients and different locations all over the world that I, I find very inspiring and empowering and you know if I can continue to do that for the rest of my life I'll be very very lucky fantastic I think that's good advice to be honest it's should good. we jump into some advice pieces because we're running to the end now um, it'd be good to pick Tim's brain of course um, for some more sort of strategic things so yeah. first question for me and we touched on it before we had we, we had a discussion around this uh, for our viewers and for us as well to be honest if I want to be successful on LinkedIn Point by point, what do I do? Point by point, um, create value for your audience. Uh, I know that sounds like a bullshit answer, but no, genuinely, you know, I think think how you're going to be perceived. Mm. Um, realistically, video content still massively championed on the platform, and if you either have the capabilities or, to be honest, the balls to you know shoot video of yourself adding value to your audience, that's a very quick fire way to to at least generate some tr- traction. The other thing is going to be consistency. You know, don't worry if you first post or second post or third post only gets a couple hundred views you know that that is the nature of it and if you give up you're never going to get you know the the lofty success that you kind of see other people doing um and so yeah i think that combination of focusing on how you're adding value to the audience focusing on how that's also going to come across like don't be bragging about case studies don't be you know showing off the things that you've done making sure you're really careful of how that's going to be perceived um and then also you know that consistency as well is is probably the two major things i would definitely say don't be bragging is, is something that um, is, is close to us. We recorded a podcast episode earlier. I'm not sure when it's out, um, but we recorded a podcast episode on the topic of how to prevent people from unfollowing you on social media. And one of the biggest points was don't be annoying. Yeah. <laughs> um, do you see that a lot? People sort of... Oh, all the time. People are so fucking annoying. Um, and I think that's like... Some, some of it is, I think, a little bit of the American market. They're just a bit more brash. Um, which is fine. And, and you know... It, it works really well for them. Um, I would always say I'm a bit more, con- you know, a conservative Brit, and there's you know specific topics that I'm happy to talk about. Um, when it comes to business, there's things that I've experienced, and I always try and portray things based on my experience or based on what I've seen. Not this is what you have to do. And I think there's a massive difference. So um, a kind of mini example we talked off of there is I categorically believe that working harder puts you in a position to be more successful. Could not believe that anymore. However, what I won't do, which is you know what Gary Vee does, and really, I think one of the reasons that there's opinion divided on him is he'll go, you have to work harder or you won't be successful. You know, it's pretty similar, practically the same information, you know, work harder, but it's you know delivered in two very different ways. And mm. I'm very much more, you know, this is what I've done, this is why I can say that, I'll talk on anything, influencer marketing, social media marketing, content, brand, because I've done it, I've got the case studies, I have credibility, what I won't tell you how to do is, you know, how to run 10 multi-billion dollar businesses uh, and give you some ideas and sort of put them out into the ether that way, but I won't go, you have to do this to be successful because um, I think there's lots of different ways you can be successful. Do you think that spawns a lot 
of what we call the entrepreneurs, people that talk. We we used to make a joke saying uh, big things happening because you see so many people, especially in the so entrepreneurs. Small, yeah. yeah, especially in the social media. Yeah. This in the is just the start. Space. Yeah, yeah. Twenty nineteen is my year. Big things happening. Yeah, what, it's what frustrating. Um, yeah, I think this has been covered by a lot of people. That yeah. entrepreneurship has been glamorized. Um, people see the top one percent, the private jets, the traveling. It, it, you know, they see, you know, even Steve's best life. But what they don't see is Steve working at three o'clock in the morning. Like that guy's sleep patterns fucked because um, he works so hard. And, and you know, that's a testament to him. And you know, same with Gary Vee, they don't see the sacrifices he has to make for his family and things that are really important to him because he works so hard. You know, the for them it massively outweighs that. So it's not, a, you know, it's not a decision. But a lot of these entrepreneurs don't want to put in the groundwork or don't, you know, see it through when there is a tough time. They'll kind of, you know, oh, why is it? Why is it? Why me? And, you know, they kind of play the victim and because it's not easy. Um, and sometimes, you know, there's very smart people that have no success. And, you know, that's a market thing. That's a balance thing. It's timing. It could be all these things. And there's also some fucking stupid people that are extremely successful based on, you know, specific circumstances. So. I think, you know, the one thing you control, put yourself in that best position to be successful. And that's, you know, what I kind of preach, you know, you guys are doing some great work. That's what you could, that's what you can control. You can't control whether, you know, Brexit's going to affect stuff, whether Brexit improves stuff, whether there's going to be a financial crash. We don't know, but what you can control is what you're doing. So it's like the iceberg effect, isn't it? So people are putting out a lot of, um, influential people are putting out a lot of value yes but at the same time they're showing all of the good stuff not necessarily like you say the 3am working in the morning not seeing your kids for a week straight and things like that and that's a lot of what I think and I used to be in that sort of in that mindset years ago before I started was oh the entrepreneur life's glamorous look he's got a Rolex and a private jet and um, there's no downside to it it's because you don't see that downside and that's what social media is doing to us I think isn't it definitely and I think but I also think that's the same for all businesses that you look at uh, one example is like a club owner like you don't see them cleaning the toilets or anything like that. You just see, you know, the champagne, the sparklers flying with the bottles, them schmoozing with celebrities. But, you know, that sometimes they're the only ones left there and it's not clean or the cleaners don't come in or whatever mm. it is. And they have to do some of those like, literal, more dirty jobs. And that's just the nature of business, I think. And um, I think there is going to be this trend and it's actually kind of nice when it comes to sort of body confidence. You see in this kind of like Instagram versus reality trend which I think you know is quite interesting you know the the perfect shot where you're in the middle of the picture and it looks great and you've got a great smile and you look you know healthy and or toned or whatever it is and then you've got the the pre-take where you're like all crushed and you, you know you think you, you're pulling a stupid face and a bird's about to shit on you or whatever it was you know and I think that there is that you know authenticity around social media is going to become a bit of a trend and I think that's a good thing um but yeah people don't necessarily know what they're they're jumping into and you know financially it is a massive risk and um i think as time goes on as you guys know running a business you just you know you just learn more and you kind of become more comfortable in you know being responsible for your income and or employees incomes or you know understanding how to manage your cash flow or when corporation tax is coming up when your vat needs to be paid there's just so many lots of little things none of them are super difficult it's just about you know understanding when those things are going to happen and, and how to kind of you know, um, overcome them, shall we say. Authenticity on social media is something that's, again, a big big buzzword around, even when you say, like, supermodels. Some of them, I mean, a lot of them got in trouble, well, not in trouble, but there was a few cases last year where models started posting pictures of, like, before shots, before shoots, the imperfect stuff, and they actually yep. started losing followers because they were being authentic because people didn't want to see that. But then they started gaining followers because they were authentic. <laughs> and I think it's it's just that, yeah. you know, you're going to lose people in the short term. Again, we mentioned it on our podcast episode a few days ago. You're going to lose top followers or lose um, lose uh, people that, that, that look up to you in the short term because they don't agree with it but then you're going to gain more over time because it's that authenticity people are going to people are going to sniff out whether you're whether you're bullshitting them or not I think so definitely I mean my Instagram on a personal level I reckon I could drive more business if it was really focused on social media marketing and what I'm doing but for me I get so much more enjoyment being able to scroll through and see all the places I've travelled and mm. I've got a terrible memory and like actually those pictures actually act as a trigger mm. of just like oh shit I remember when that was like well, I remember when we did that and that was really cool or oh no that was such a good night and that was or that was a great you know talk so there's kind of facets from all parts of my life but having that as a kind of a, a catalogue of all the great things that have happened you know is how I use it it's not just 
these kind of infographics of motivational quotes. I mean, yeah, it's, it's the sort of um, Gary Vee said that, well, doesn't it? Yeah. He wish he wished he was documenting his life back when he was building his first business at thirty. And imagine that if someone imagine if like we had a documentary of like Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak building Apple. Be mm-hmm. insane. Trust That'd be them. insane, wouldn't it? Yeah. So I think that's that's the reason people do it. But again, there is a lot of people doing it for the wrong reasons, and that is, oh, let, I just got a new watch. Let me just show it off, sort of thing. Um, so there's a lot of that, but we'll see we'll see how that how that sort of goes, and uh, with people, people transparency sort of shines through in the end. We've got a fun game for you at Amazing. the end. Uh, Matt is going to play yeah, twenty questions just... for you um, oh, yeah. that were highly requested by the audience, like the one we made the <laughs> weekend. Um, but we just thought it might be a good uh, good anecdote to end. If there's anything you want to add or any questions you want to add, uh, then feel free. And if there's any comments back or anything, we'll pop them straight through to you. Amazing. But these lovely people will be going your way anyway because you've provided a lot of value. And um, yeah, if you want to know more from Tim's world, um, then go follow him. We'll probably stick all of his social media in the description um, wherever you're listening or watching this anyway. Fantastic. Go. You ready? As ready as, ready as I'll ever be. <laughs> Game or listen to music? Uh, like, I would listen to music while doing something else. So. See, I was thinking that as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah a combined one. But I do like, I play a lot. It's quick fire, quick fire. Okay. <laughs> FIFA over music, cool. <laughs> NBA finals or Champions League final again? Champions League final again. That's only because Liverpool won it the other day. Absolutely. <laughs> Corner or Vindaloo? Um, Corner. Favourite city in America? New York. What did you have for breakfast today? Uh, just coffee. <laughs> Well, that one. No. Uh, would, would, would you rather stand up all day or sit down all day? Um, sit down all day. Fanta or tango? Tango, lemon. Ooh. Cinema or Netflix? Depends who with. Netflix, bigger scope. <laughs> AirPods or Dray Beats? Uh, AirPods. Have you ever Googled yourself? Yes. What's your hidden talent? Um, I do not have any talent. No. What would your stage name be? Oh shit! Um, That's a good one, Matt. Yeah, I have no <laughs> idea. Never been asked. <laughs> <laughs> well, we just uh, what, uh, what would your stage name? Did I ask you that one? Yeah. Uh, uh, Harry Bow, hundreds of thousands. Uh, Harry Bow. What's your favorite quote ever? Oh, um, there's a couple. Um, social media quote um, is um, social media marketing is the oldest oldest form of marketing. Word of mouth using the newest form of technology. Um, and then there's like a a cool JJ Watt quote, who's a, a NFL player. And it's, uh, I'm not going to go to that. It's, I'll tell you that. All right. YouTube or Instagram TV? Uh, YouTube. If you're a music artist, what genre would you be? Grind. Would you rather be able to fly or be invisible? Invisible if I could turn it on and off. What's your proudest moment? Um, This is a long answer. Uh, either getting named 30 under 30 or when it was like very early on at social chain we won like the drum buzz awards yeah. and there was like 10 of us in the office we sent a guy called cello on his like second day to the awards because yeah. like, he was based in london and we didn't think we'd win we just got this like notification at like 11 o'clock, o'clock in the office we'd had a few beers and been playing some ping pong and it was just this like surreal moment we we're against up against like ogilvy and all these big agencies and that sharing that moment with people you really care about is one of my favorite memories wow That's my Going from that proud, it yeah. goes down a little bit of hill now. <laughs> Would you rather be four foot five or seven foot seven? Um, seven foot seven and play basketball. Hey, what would you, what do you wish you knew, knew five years ago? Um, that happiness is more important than financial gain. There we go. I That's think a lot of people know. It's Twenty questions. You survived. <sighs> Just about some bad answers there, some long answers. So. <laughs> no, that's good. No, that's good. That's good. Uh, that's the end, isn't it? That's, 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 that's all the questions yeah, we've got. Thanks again for joining us. That's, Thanks so much, It's been fellas. good. I'm sure the audience will take some value bombs from this. Absolutely, um, yeah. Loads of good information for everyone to take in. Yeah, we wish we had more time to actually yeah. take more stuff, but hey, maybe, who knows, maybe in a few more times we'll get you back in or something. Sounds we good. Have, we have a bigger set or something. <laughs>